The next ayah, ayah number 92. Inna hadihi ummatukum ummatan wahida wa ana rabbukum fa'budun. Truly this community of yours is one community. And I am your Lord, so worship me. Now why does why is this verse mentioned at the end of the, the discussion about all of these prophets? the 16 or so prophets that are mentioned. Because when you read about Nuh, about Musa, about Harun, about Yunus, about Lut, about Ibrahim, you may have this impression that all of these prophets, they were founders of their own religion. They preached their own unique message. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here is reminding us that you are one community, you have one religion, and despite the multiplicity of the prophets mentioned in this surah, the doctrine and the reality of God's oneness is always the same. So all of these prophets that were mentioned, they are, they are, a, they are your history, meaning that you are part of this one community that began with Adam, that continued through Nuh and Ibrahim and Musa. So this is one religious community because all of them preached monotheism. All of them preached justice, social justice, morality. Their message was the same. Truly this community of yours is one community. And I am your Lord. So worship me. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says in his wasiyah to Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam, or one of his sons, وَعَلَمْ يَا بُنَيْ No, O oh my dear son, أَنَّهُ لَوْ كَانَ لِرَبِّكَ شَرِيكَ لَأَتَتْكَ لَأَتَتْكَ رُسُولُهُ وَلَعَرَفْتَ أَفْعَالَهُ وَصِفَاتَهُ Oh, my son, know that if Allah had a partner, his messengers would have come to you. And you would have known his actions and his attributes. But your Lord is one. And he is the Lord who sent Nuh and Ibrahim. That this is one message. And this is what was echoed earlier in the surah, in ayah number 25 of this, this same surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِ إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَّا أَنَا فَعْبُدُونَ That we have not sent before you any messenger except that we reveal to them that there is no God but, but me, so worship me. Now, in the next ayah, so, so ayah number 92 reminds us that despite the multiplicity of prophets in different parts of the world at different times, the message is the same. The message is unique. In the deen and Allah al-Islam, all of those religions were Islam. Now, the, the jurisprudence may have changed. The, the, the laws may have changed. But the essence of the religion has remained the same. Ayah number 93. But they fragmented their affair among themselves. Now, they fragmented their affair among themselves is not referring to the prophets. It's referring to their followers because the, the fragmentation and the division and the formation of sects happens at the hands of the followers. All of the prophets are, in, are, are unified. The message of God is one. But the, the formation of these various sects, this is, the, this is what happens at the hands of the followers. بينهم, 
but they fragmented their affair among themselves. Each is returning to us. Now, when Allah says each is returning to us, it's a reminder that these differences, they do exist, they will exist. It's natural for, for these sacks and these different groups to form. But Allah says at the end of the day, they will all return to us. And these differences will be settled on the day of judgment. And this is one of the benefits. This, this is one of the things that will be achieved on the day of judgment. You know, the day of judgment is not just a day where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds us to account and he compensates us for our actions. It's a day in which the things that we used to argue about and disagree on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will bring out the truth. Allah in Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayah number 48, He says, إِلَى marji'ukum." To Allah you shall all return. إِلَى اللَّهِ مَرْجِعُكُمْ جَمِعًا To Allah you shall all return. فَيُنَبِّئُكُمْ بِمَا كُنْتُمْ فِيهِ تَخْتَلِفُونَ to Allah you shall all return and he shall inform you about what you used to disagree on. He will inform you about what you used to dispute over. So when it comes to, for example, the issue of the nature of Jesus Christ, was he, the Jews say that he was a false prophet. The Christians say, the majority of the Christians, they say that he is the son of God. The Muslims say that he's a messenger of God. So there's ikhtilaf. Allah here on the day of judgment, he says, Kullun You know, Jesus said one thing, either, he, either he's a false prophet, he's a true prophet, or he's the son of God, right? You, you can't say that they're all, they're all right. You know, that, that's why we, re, we reject this this type of pluralism where we say, you know, everybody's right and every, we have to accept everybody's position. No, at the end of the day, there is one truth. There is one reality. Allah says, I will inform you on the day of judgment about, for example, the issue of Isa. On the day of judgment, you know, the biggest dispute that we have today, especially among the Muslims is what? Who did the prophet appoint as his, as his successor? The majority of the Muslims, they say it was Abu Bakr. The followers of Ahlul Bayt, the Shia, they say it was Ali ibn Abi Talib. When is this going to be clear to everybody? On the Day of Judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will disclose the truth. So, Allah says, but they fragmented their affair among themselves. And this applies to almost every religious community. The same applies to the community of, of Adam, of Nuh, of Musa, Isa. All of these differences and these sects, everyone is claiming to follow the truth. Allah says, I will inform you. You, will, you are all returning to me and this will, be, this will be settled. Now speaking of this issue of, of أمرهم, this idea of being fragmented, you know, unfortunately, you know, this happened shortly after the, the demise of the Prophet. And there were even some non-Muslims who were taking advantage of this. And they were trying to fan the flames of sectarianism. And now there's a, uh, a narration, it's mentioned in Nahjul Balagha, where a Jewish man, a man from Bani Israel, he came to Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he saw that, you know, the, Muslim, the Prophet had just passed away, you know, because many Jews were still living in Medina. And they saw all of this commotion and this, this disunity, this ikhtilaf. So this man, this Jewish man, he comes and he basically says, مَا دَفَنْتُمْ نَبِيَّكُمْ حَتَّى اخْتَلَفْتُمْ فِيهِ That you people, you Muslims, 
You haven't even buried your prophet yet. You just buried him. Just barely. You buried him and you're already fighting each other. He says this and Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, he hears this. Now look at how Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen responds to someone who is trying to divide the ranks of the believers. Imam Ali salam he says to this man, that we disagree over what he taught. We don't disagree about whether he's a prophet or not. So here Amir al-Mu'mineen is reminding this, this Jewish man, this man from Bani Israel, that do not try to exaggerate the nature of our dispute. We dispute over what he meant, what he taught. We dispute over what he said. We don't dispute the essence of his messengerhood. And then Amir al-Mu'mineen, he reminds this Jewish man of his own history. The Imam says, وَلَكِنَّكُمْ مَا جَفَّتْ أَرْجُلُكُمْ مِنَ الْبَحْرِ حَتَّى قُلْتُمْ لِنَبِيِّكُمْ اِجْعَلْ لَنَا إِلَاهًا كَمَا لَهُمْ آلِهًا The Imam السلام, he says, but your ancestors, when their feet were still wet from the salt water of the Red Sea, they turned to Musa because they had passed by a village and they said to Musa, oh, a village of idol worshippers, and they said to Musa, oh Musa, can you make one idol for us just like they have, just like their idols? They have many idols. We just want one. So here the Imam is saying that who are you to poke fun at Muslims about their disagreements after the death of their prophet? Your ancestors abandoned Tawheed and their feet were still wet and they had just witnessed the great miracle of the splitting of the, the Red Sea. So who are you to talk about disunity and, and being lost after the death of our prophet? And this is important for us, brothers and sisters, because the reality of the world that we live in is that there is, there is ikhtilaf. The Ummah is fragmented. We see many different sects within the Islamic tradition. So how are we supposed to respond? How do we deal with, how do we, how do we deal with, uh, with other sects within the Islamic tradition? Now there are three ways we can approach the other sects and the other groups within Islam. The first is we, we fight to eliminate them. And this is what, this is the takfiri ideology. This is what the khawarij were trying to do. This is what ISIS is trying to do, right? Where if you disagree with me, you have to be eliminated. Right? So this is one. So one, one way to deal with differing sex is to just say that we have to just eliminate them. But of course, alhamdulillah, the majority, the overwhelming majority of the ummah does not take that approach. Which brings us to our second approach. The second approach is that, okay, we're not gonna, we're not gonna fight each other. We're not gonna try to kill each other. Rather, we will, we will live in isolation. Meaning, you know, the idea of lakum dinakum waliyadin. You have your religion and we have our religion. Now, unfortunately, many Muslims have employed this approach. They've taken this approach. But this is the approach that the Prophet takes with kuffar. It's not the approach that we should take with other, other Muslims. So this is the idea that, okay, we're not going to fight you. We're not going to antagonize you. but the Shias forget about the Sunnis and the Sunnis should forget about the Shias. That we should live in our own bubbles. We should live in complete isolation of one another. However, this, you know, if you look at, you know, Surah Al-Hujurat, which we, we studied earlier, 
the ayah says what? إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَى Verily, the believers are brothers. Allah doesn't say that the believers are friends or they're, they're acquaintances. They are brothers. So in the same way that, you know, you cannot sever ties with your brother, with your biological brothers, with your, with your family members, we shouldn't sever ties with, with other Muslims. And there is a beautiful statement by Al-Alam Al-Amini, the author of Al-Ghadir, in volume five of his book, he mentions this ayah, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً And he says, the Shias have always understood that brotherhood, this idea of إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ إِخْوَةً that brotherhood includes people of other sects. Meaning that you can't say, oh, he's my brother in faith, but I never interact with him, and we live in complete isolation. In fact, brothers and sisters, if you look at Amir al-Mu'mineen, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib did not isolate himself from those who were the most active in Saqifah. You know, if you look at the source of all of our problems, it comes from the individuals who orchestrated Saqifah. Did Amir al-Mu'mineen completely isolate himself? From these khulafa, he didn't. Now, of course, the Imam السلام, made his position very clear, but the Imam did not isolate himself. He still gave advice. When they asked him for advice, Imam Amir al Mumini didn't say to them, you know what, go to hell because you didn't pay allegiance to me, you didn't accept me as the, the rightful Khalifa of the Prophet, therefore I have nothing to do with you. The Imam still gave them advice. He, he was still seen as a part of the the ummah. So it's unfair for us as Shias to say, you know what, we have nothing to do with these Sunnis. The Imam didn't even do that with the perpetrators of, of Saqifa. So this shows that we should not take this approach of isolation. That we should be active members. So isolation is not acceptable. And even, even if you look at the seerah of the Imams of Ahlul Bayt, you find that all, almost all of the Imams, they lived in Medina. Now, Medina was not a Shia city. Medina was predominantly inhabited by people who were not Shia. Imam al-Sadiq never t- told his followers that, you know what, let us go migrate somewhere else and we start our own community. That we should leave Medina we should detach ourselves, we should separate ourselves, and we form our own little community where it's just us Shias. The Imam lived in Medina, he interacted with those who didn't follow the Madhab of Ahlul Bayt. He did not isolate himself. So this is important for us to learn. So therefore, the way that we should deal with this issue of ikhtilaf, the way that we should deal with other sects is that we should maintain our identity. No one is saying that we should compromise. That it, it doesn't mean that you know Islamic unity doesn't mean that you know what? Okay, we're not going to talk about Ghadir. We're not going to talk about what happened to Fatima to Zara. That's not what we're saying. We should maintain our identity. We should be committed to our theology, to our history. But we should treat with we should treat each other with respect. We should have dialogue with each other. We should attend each other's weddings. We should attend each other's funerals. We should visit each other. We should visit each other's mosques. And we, we can even have debates, that's fine. But we should not be antagonistic. We should not engage in unwarranted provocation. You know, oftentimes, especially on YouTube, you know, you see you know, these Shia and Sunni debates. And oftentimes, you know what happens? It becomes a shouting match. It becomes about, you know, how to own and how to humiliate the other person. And oftentimes you see one or both parties are getting angry. 
they're getting emotional. There's a hadith from the Ahlul Bayt, السلام, they say, رحم الله امرأن ترك المراء ولو كان محقا May Allah have mercy upon the one who abandons argumentation even if they're right. You know, sometimes you get in, you have a debate, you argue, you discuss, and you see that the other person is getting agitated. They're getting angry. As followers of Ahlul Bayt, if we're having a debate, we're having a discussion with members of Ahlul Sunnah, and they're getting bothered, they're feeling offended, that's when we should stop. We should stop. We don't need to upset people. The goal of these discussions is not to upset people. If you see the other person is becoming defensive, our imams have taught us that you should leave them. Because the, the goal of this is not to offend people, not to make them emotional. It's to make the truth clear. And if they're not ready to hear the truth, then you leave them. You pray for their guidance and you leave them. But we don't want to insult. We don't want to hurt people's feelings. We don't want to, you know, agitate people. So the approach that we should take is that we should peacefully coexist and we should interact with one another. We shouldn't isolate each other. We shouldn't act as though we are members of two different religions. You know, there's a uh, hadith, and I'll share this one and then we'll move on to the next verse. There's a hadith from Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam where he says, Man salla khalfahum, The one who prays behind them meaning behind someone who is from Ahlul Sunnah. كَانَ كَمَنْ صَلَّى خَلْفَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ فِي الصَّفِ الْأَوَّلِ That person is just like the one who was prayed behind the Prophet in the first row. Now, there are two ways to understand this hadith. Some have understood this hadith as, you know, this is only in circumstances of taqiyya, that if you feel like you're afraid for your safety then, to preserve your life, pray behind, you know, someone who follows a different method. However, other scholars have said, no, the reason why the imam is attaching such a great reward to praying behind them is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be united. How else are they going to know the truth unless we participate in their functions? Unless we go to their mosques, unless we go to their centers, if we if you only pray in your masjid and they only pray in their masajid, how are they going to be exposed to the ulum of Ahlul Bayt? So this show of brotherhood and sisterhood is so commendable that Imam al-Sadiq says, "Man salla khalfahum kana kaman salla khalf Rasulillah fi al-saf al-awwal." Now going back to the uh, uh, going back to Surah Al-Anbiya. So Allah says, "Kullun ilayna raji'un." So, but they have fragmented. So even though you are one community, you are one nation, you are one religion, and all of these prophets propagated one message. Unfortunately, people fragmented their affair, and. And each is returning to us, meaning all of these issues of ikhtilaf, they will be settled on the day of judgment. Now, what is important for us? You know, sometimes you and I, we become so obsessed and so adamant that I have to prove this person wrong. We spend so much time trying to convince other people of what is the truth. And that has its place. But some of us are so obsessed with that that we forget the most important thing, our most important duty in this life, and that is what? Allah says in ayah number 94, And whoever performs righteous deeds and is a believer, there shall be no ingratitude for his endeavor and surely we shall write it down for him. The most important thing, brothers and sisters, is for you and I to have to do good. And if you look at the verse, 
And whoever performs some righteous deeds, this min, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ This preposition min means some. Allah is not asking for much. And whoever performs some righteous deeds and is a believer. You know, these are two important conditions for something, for a good deed to be accepted by Allah. It's not enough to just do good. Your belief system is also important because what you truly believe becomes the basis for your actions. You know, there's a difference between what you claim to believe and what you actually believe. On the day of judgment, what will benefit you is what you actually believe. You know, many of us, we claim to believe in the day of judgment. We claim to believe in Allah. Just claiming belief is not sufficient. If you want to verify whether you really believe something or not, it needs to be reflected in your actions. If you really believe something, that belief has to be reflected in your conduct. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الصَّالِحَةِ Whoever does some righteous deeds and is a believer. So iman and amal salih. So, so your deeds are only accepted, meaning they have a benefit in the hereafter. They are carried over into the afterlife if they are coupled with iman. Now, of course, if someone does good in this life, they will also reap the advantages of, of the good that they do. Allah will reward them. They will benefit in this life. But if someone doesn't have any faith and they were not justified in, in their lack of faith, meaning that they had the resources, they had access to the truth, but they, they reject it. Now, these people are not excused. So Allah says, and whoever performs some righteous deeds and is a believer. Now, what does it mean to have iman, to be a believer? What do you have to believe in? If you go to Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 285, Allah gives a summary of the things that we have to believe, that we have to have conviction about. Ayah number 285 of Surah Al-Baqarah, The Messenger of, believes in what has been sent, sent to him from his Lord. The believers, All of the believers believe in God. Number one. And they also believe in angels. And they believe in the scriptures. You have to believe in the Quran and all of the scriptures that were sent because you know that God has been tirelessly trying to guide humanity. And one of the ways that he guides is through these scriptures. وَرُسُلِهِ Belief in his messengers. لَا نُفَرِّقُ بَيْنَ أَحَدٍ مِّنْ رُسُلِهِ We do not distinguish between any of his messengers. Now here, distinguish mean, means that you don't accept one and then reject the other. You believe in all of them and you believe in their unified message. وَقَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَأَطَعْنَا And they say, we hear, we listen, and we obey. Right. So there's an element of obedience. Faith is not just an idea. It's about translating that into obedience. غُفْرَانَكَ رَبَّنَا وَإِلَيْكَ الْمَصِيرِ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and whoever performs some righteous deeds and is a believer. Again, Allah is not asking us for much. You know, it, it could be a single good deed that is the reason why Allah admits you into paradise. Allah is not asking you for a lot. In Dua Kumail, you know, every Thursday we, we utter these words. Ya Sariya al Oh, the one who is easily pleased. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِنَ الصَّالِحَاتِ وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ And then Allah says, فَلَا كُفْرَانَ لِلْسَعِيَ The word kufran, the word kuf, sometimes is used as the opposite of iman. So you have mu'min and then kafir. And then sometimes kufran or kuf is used as the opposite of shukr. 
Sometimes kof is used and it means the opposite of shukr, which is why the ayah is translated, there shall be no ingratitude for his endeavor. Now, one of the names of Allah is ash-shakur, the one who is grateful. Now, what does it mean when we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is grateful. What it means, grateful, shakur, shukr, it means taqdeer, appreciation. Allah appreciates our effort. And appreciates our effort means that He doesn't treat the good doer and the evil doer the same. He appreciates the effort of the good doer and showers them with His mercy, He rewards them. And Allah says, there shall be no ingratitude for his endeavor. What Allah expects of us is what? Sa'i, effort. You know, sometimes, you know, we think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ex expects perfection from us. Allah doesn't expect perfection. He expects effort. You know, let's say someone makes an effort to wake up for Salat al-Fajr and they just don't. They made a sincere effort to wake up for Salat al-Fajr, but they missed Salat al-Fajr. So the result was what? That they missed Salat al-Fajr. Allah will still reward them because they made a sincere effort to wake up for Salat al-Fajr. It was beyond their ability. Let's say that they were very tired and they just physically were not able to get up. They couldn't hear their alarm. Allah is not going to punish such a person. Because Allah says, I am, I am not ungrateful uh, towards your effort. Let's say someone is putting so much effort. You know, they haven't prayed their, their five daily prayers in years. And they're putting effort. And they prayed all of them, but they missed one. Allah is still going to show them appreciation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not... There shall be no ingratitude for his endeavor, for his effort. What Allah wants is for us to be people of effort. There's someone, for example, God forbid, who's been drinking alcohol all of his life. And now he's making a sincere effort to stop. And he's having trouble or she's having trouble and they're trying to wean themselves out. And some days they're having trouble. Allah is going to reward them for the effort that they're putting into breaking that habit. So sometimes we get so fixated on the end result that that we often we discredit people. We discount that, oh, this guy, you know, he, he drinks a cup of wine. Yeah, now he drinks one cup a day. Before he was drinking three bottles. Allah appreciates the effort that this person is making to reduce and eventually eliminate this habit. You know, the, 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 the sister that is wearing hijab and her hijab is not perfect. You might look at her and say, oh, who is this? You know, why can't she cover her hair? Yes, part of her hair is showing now, but before there was no hijab. At least part of it is covered. She's putting in effort. Now, you and I, we might be ungrateful. We might not appreciate their struggle. But Allah says, فَلَا كُفْرَانَ لِسَعِيدٍ there shall be no ingratitude for his endeavor. We have, to, we have to respect where people are in their journey to Allah. We don't see the struggles that these people face. You know, brothers and sisters, there are some sisters who, who might not have the best hijab, but they come from families who are pressuring them to completely remove the hijab. So the fact that they're wearing a partial hijab is an improvement. It's something they deserve credit for. It's a struggle for them even to wear that partial hijab. You and I, we don't appreciate that effort, but Allah does. فَلَا كُفْرَانِ لِسَعِيَ وَإِنَّا لَهُ كَاتِبُونَ And Allah says, and we shall write it down for him. Now, what's interesting here is that, that Allah says that he's, he will write it down. The good, the effort that we put in, in doing good. Now, usually 
crimes need to be documented. You know, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day of judgment, he says to you, enter Jannah. Are you going to ask for receipts? Ya Allah, show me my deeds. No. If Allah says, go to Jannah, you're going to run. You don't even want to see your deeds. But people who have committed sins, they want evidence, right? Show me the evidence that I committed the sin. Why does Allah say, I record even the good that you do? Why is that? It's because Allah wants to honor us. You know, in the same way, when you graduate from college, you have your degree, you have a certificate, you hang it up on the wall. It becomes a source of pride for you. It represents your effort. Allah records the good that we do. And he hands us this book of deeds because he wants to honor us that this is what you did. In the same way that we, we cherish our diplomas and our degrees, you know, the university could just tell you, by the way, you're, you're a doctor now, but you want it. You want that certificate. You want that diploma. Why? Because it's a source of pride for you, that it's documented, that it's proof that you achieved something, something noteworthy. So with that, inshallah, we'll we'll conclude uh, there and we'll keep, we'll pick up with ayah number ninety-five next week. Bismillah wa sallallahu ala Muhammad wa alihi al-tahirin.